still waiting. I think we're live now, so okay. <laughs> Let me just I wanna double check our crowd count people aren't screaming. Can't see ya. I always like it when someone says like I can see you now. Yeah. <laughs> I might even ask. Yeah, I still have live stream is starting soon, so I'll wait for that to pop up and get going here. I see Jen Dahl is on. Oh, um, good. Hi, Jen Dahl. Yeah, yeah, she's on the um, on the crowdcast off to the side, kind of tweeting and talking. Um, we have another Wisconsin person here, Wisconsin representing. We love Wisconsin. I do. I do like Wisconsin. Yeah. It's a pretty state. I've um, been there a couple of times myself. Hey, Rob, Jane Langenfeld is here, too. Oh, so good. Exciting good. times. Yeah, it is. It's nice to hear some names, I know. All right. Cool. All right, man. Well, Tim, we are, I just got the okay from a couple of people that we are visible and live, so if you want to um, kind of get us rolling and get us started. All right, let's do this. Welcome to AOE Live, episode number 17. We're recording this show live on Tuesday, November 10th. Bob Rieger, the coordinator of the 2016 National Art Education Association Convention in Chicago, will join us to talk about the convention, the importance of NAEA membership and leadership both in and out of the classroom. I am Tim Bogatz, a high school teacher from Omaha, Nebraska. Hey, everybody, and I'm Andrew McCormick, and I am a middle school and high school art teacher in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And Bob, as we said, is the coordinator of the national convention coming up in Chicago. He is also the 2017 NAEA National Elementary Art Teacher of the Year and co-past president of the Nebraska Art Teachers Association. So, Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks, you. Thanks. I'm happy to be with you tonight and uh, look forward to having this conversation. Definitely. Awesome. Uh, we want to say hello to our listeners and those of you that are watching live. Please join in, participate, converse, and be part of the show. Yep, we definitely like hearing from you guys. You can chat on the AOE Live page, ask questions of Bob um, off on the side of Crowdcast and also using the hashtag AOE Live on Twitter. Uh, we do check that Crowdcast regularly and we can always, um, you guys can always ask questions and then upvote other people's questions and we try to ask at least one or two of the, of the guests that we have. All right, and as always, once we're done tonight, the podcast will be available on the AOE Live page and will go up later this week on iTunes and Stitcher. Listen to it on your drive to school, at home in the evening, or even during your plan time. <laughs> All right, so Bob, let's get right into talking about the National Convention. I'm super, super stoked and very excited. Um, a lot of people, you know, they love the idea of a National Convention. Uh, we like networking and feeding on all the energy and returning. Um, so what do you think are some of the biggest benefits of attending a national convention that people get out of it? Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Tim. I also appreciate the Art of Education allowing me to join you tonight. Um, well, you've highlighted several of those right there, Andrew. Um, there's really nothing like getting together um, with thousands of art educators from around the world um, as you learn from one another and celebrate and laugh one another because we do a, a, a lot of laughing as we enjoy the, uh, the convention. It's the only place where all different kinds of art educators, whether they're PK-12, um, school district leaders, museum educators, college and university professors, undergrads, as well as graduate students, researchers and scholars, teaching artists and art therapists, as well as any other art educator uh, that's out there that I haven't mentioned, come together to learn and, and gather um, specifically in Chicago this next spring. They actually come from every single state in the United States, and we have often 30 countries plus worldwide that actually wow. attend as well. Um, so the power of the, the convention itself um, brings us together in a, in a synergistic way, um, and it brings them together people that are very passionate about art education. So how did you um, get to be the coordinator of this upcoming national convention, and what do those uh, responsibilities entail? Like, when I think about it, I, it just makes my head spin, and I'm like, never know. <laughs> you just could I do what Bob is embarking upon. <laughs> Well, you, you got to jump in with both feet, let me tell you. You, you can't be afraid. You just got to do it. Um, they actually, the position that I have um, is one that is appointed by the NAEA president. So uh, Pat Franklin, who at the time was the elect, uh, contacted me. And uh, through conversations, we decided that uh, we were going to go ahead and, and uh, work together. And, of course, the board had to approve my appointment as well. 
Um, and so when I was appointed, um, I was asked to try to bring vision and concept to the overall uh, convention experience, which every single coordinator is expected to do. Um, and it really is an incredible experience for art educators who have an interest in um, taking control and, and helping to manu uh, maneuver and design um, some of the largest uh, development that happens um, in our field. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the uh, different kinds of uh, responsibilities I have uh, mainly is to just put together a team of art educators to work um, in order to collaborate um, along with the NAA staff um, to design the convention experience so it benefits everybody that's in attendance. Um, so it's, uh, it's a lot of conference calls, uh, it's a lot of conversations uh, through email, um, and it's just uh, it's an opportunity for a group of people to get together and really put together a package um, that will really um, inspire art educators uh, uh, as they pursue whatever kinds of goals they might be working on. All right. Very cool. Okay, and you touched on this just a little bit here, but you know, if we can look, or if we can ask you to look a little bit behind the scenes, uh, how mm -hmm. long has planning been happening for the convention? And if you can talk maybe a little bit about the process, uh, how many people are involved, and, mm -hmm. and how much work goes into putting on just a huge event like this. You bet. Um, approximately 18 months. Um, goes in from the beginning wow. until actually convention. So we've started a long time ago. Um, and actually, as we are trying to wrap up this convention, there's actually work starting on New York for 2017. So I've actually been in communication with yeah. uh, the convention coordinators for New York as we've already been talking about some ideas that maybe we weren't able to quite fulfill or get done in Chicago that maybe we'd pass along to New York because they would maybe try to mm -hmm. those kinds of things out. Um, so as you can imagine, right. um, the convention is a huge undertaking. Um, and what's really nice is we give every member when they attend the convention the opportunity to participate in guiding the following year's convention. We have a comprehensive, comprehensive evaluation um, that are thoroughly reviewed by staff. Um, I had the opportunity to look through the evaluations as well uh, to really take into account what kinds of things members are saying they want out of their experience. Um, right. And what's kind of fun about the whole process is it is really is connected to the creative process. It involves research, analysis, and then synthesizing all those ideas together mm -hmm. um, to create a convention that can be experienced through a number of different venues um, as well as lenses. Um, specifically for Chicago, um, we had a committee of about we have a committee of about a dozen uh, members that are um, all Illinois Art Education at uh, Art Education Association members, um, and that doesn't include two local co-chairs. And then, of course, we work very closely with the NAEA staff as well. Um, we are a suggesting body, so we suggest um, lots of ideas to NAEA staff, and then they ultimately make uh, the decisions and then pass those back to us, and we help to refine them and, and uh, make those different pieces work um, as a very collaborative team. Okay, very cool. Uh, now, the other question I have, the big one for me, is, you know, uh, this is happening in Chicago on St. Patrick's Day weekend. Uh, are you guys just, like, trying to embrace all that chaos as, as the convention is going on? You know, I can't think of a better day to start the convention on. Come on, it's St. Patrick's Day. We're, we're there to, uh, to really celebrate and enjoy and have a great time together. Um, but really, truly, art educators by nature, you know, we embrace chaos. And it really yeah, provides lots true. of opportunities and possibilities um, for, for lots of exciting things to happen. Um, St. Patrick's Day offers yet another incredible element to the overall convention experience. And actually, when I visited in May with the team, it's really wonderful that NAEA provides the opportunity for the whole team meet to, to meet together along with NAEA staff. We were told that a lot of the St. Patrick's Day celebration actually happens the weekend before. Um, when they have the Green River, for those of you that are familiar yeah. with the Green River, that takes place the Saturday before. Um, so oh. even though um, it is St. Patrick's Day, and I'm sure we're, we're going to have a wonderful time together, a lot of the Chicago chaos has taken place the weekend before. But okay. you have to be prepared because on uh, the night of March 17th, which is our opening night, we're going to be ready for one great green party, um, and we're actually having the uh, uh, the uh, artisan gallery that night as well. So uh, last year in New Orleans, we did a closing party. This year we decided yeah. since it was St. Patty's Day, we had to do an opening party. So right. those of you in attendance, make sure you wear your festive green. Okay, Bob, I got to I gotta ask you here. So you're, you, you know, you're telling us about St. Patty's Day conference in Chicago. 
did you wear green tonight on purpose? I Are did. you like, oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a full package. I this even have my green, so I'll even put down, I even have my green art education. Right <laughs> yes, now. love it. Oh, that's and awesome. I think the whole thing, you know, that's that's part of being a convention <laughs> coordinator, the whole package. Hey, I got to ask you a question because, you know, I've, I've gone to a number of state conferences in a row, um, six or seven, and I think I've presented at like the last five or six. And sometimes I get the feeling like I don't enjoy the conference nearly as much because I'm like really in it and I'm worried about my next room and the setup and how it's going to go. How you last last year at New Orleans? Were you even enjoying the conference or were you just so kind of like getting ready for Chicago that it's kind of hard to enjoy it as much? You know, actually, I, I was enjoying it, but then I also had an eye on all the different things that were going on, and I did ask a lot of questions. I hopped, I stopped at the hospitality table several times, kind of picked their brain about things. Uh, Susan Gabbard and Sarah Cress Ackerman, or Ackerman, who were the co-chairs last year, um, I spent lots of time on the phone with them. Um, I actually spent time on the phone with Chris Gunther, who uh, was the chair for San Diego, picked her brain a ton. So it really is a wonderful opportunity to be able to collaborate with lots of leaders. And, um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, you know, we're trying to find new cutting edge kinds of things to do, but at the same time, there are some really nice uh, strategic things that are put in place by NAEA to really help with the process. Mm -hmm. So back to uh, the upcoming conference, are there any, like what are you most excited about? Do we have any big names, specific activities you're looking forward to? Are there any secrets you can kind of let us in on or are you going to keep some things under wrap? <laughs> You know, with 18 months of planning, let me tell you, it's, it's pretty much um, the big ideas and the big concepts are, are in the books, and so uh, we're ready to start letting things out. If you've recently visited the um, arteducator.org page um, of NAEA, you'll see that we have some things that have been listed already, and in fact, registration just opened today. I was talking to uh, oh, cool. uh, a, a member who registered today, and I was able to get in and look at it too, and it's working smoothly, and uh, we hope everyone get on and register. Um, but yeah, to share some of the highlights, um, first of all, everyone uh, probably is aware that the theme is lead, share your vision for art education. Um, I I'm really thrilled about this theme just because I think it's a very comprehensive theme. I think it's a place where any art educator can find a link and a connection to other people about because we are all leaders. It doesn't matter if you're in a rural school and you're the only art teacher in the district or if you're in a huge college or uh, university or even a museum where there's lots of you, the, you're leaders in different ways and depending on the facet of what it is that you're doing. So I think it's an awesome theme and uh, um, I think everybody can embrace that. I'm very excited about uh, two of our major keynotes that are going to be joining us this year. On Thursday, Jean Houston who is an author and a researcher, she, she's actually written 26 books, uh, will deliver the keynote on Thursday morning. Um, I'm looking at my notes up here. Her, uh, her focus is on human potential movement. Uh, she's a scholar, a philosopher, as well as a researcher. So I think she really lends nicely into this idea of uh, leadership and how we can connect through it through the arts. Um, and then the, uh, the person that will close out the convention on Saturday as a keynote is Bill Strickland. Um, Dr. Deborah Reeve and uh, Pat Franklin have both seen this person speak and comes highly motivated or highly suggested by both of them. Um, he too is also an author as well as a researcher and um, he uh, has written the book Make, Making the Impossible Possible. He's really um, a dynamic kind of speaker um, who uh, has done a lot of work in terms of helping youth through the arts. So um, uh, disadvantaged youth, youth maybe that uh, run into troubles in their life, um, he has really focused a lot of his efforts on how the arts can help those children. So um, I think the messages that those two people are going to bring are really going to fit in nicely with the concept of lead, share your vision for art education. But we don't end there. There's lots of other things. Um, we have several super sessions that are planned. Uh, somebody that I actually saw on the Sunday morning show probably about six months ago. I don't know if you all watched the Sunday morning show, but I get more inspiration from that show on CBS on Sundays. Um, uh, a person named Ted Southern. I happened to see a piece on him uh, one Sunday morning. I thought out of the blue, I'm going to go ahead and uh, email him, and lo and behold, he said he could come and speak to us. Um, he has an art background, um, actually designed for Victoria's Secret, um, uh, and has designed costumes for lots of other shows, uh, uh, theatrical performances, and actually has an ongoing contract with NASA and uh, is creating spacesuits and space gloves. And so 
there's a person who has definitely taken leadership to a whole new level um, and is taking it outside of our of art and art education. So um, I'm excited that I think some people will really enjoy um, uh, what he, his message is going to be. Um, I'm going very lucky to be facilitating a group of art educators from across the United States who um, will be talking about authentic assessment. And we know how vital and how important assessment research is right now in our field. And I think the, the four people that are going to uh, speak at this, uh, this session will really bring an, a nice view and, and a nice um, uh, perspective when it comes to assessment. Olivia Goody will once again uh, provide Curriculum Slam. If you've been to a Curriculum Slam, you know how amazing it, it is. It's fast-paced. It's lots of ideas being thrown out. It's uh, very entertaining at the same time. And uh, if you haven't been to it, uh, you're definitely going to want to come to Chicago. Olivia is from Chicago, so it's right in her own uh, backyard. So I think, uh, I think people will enjoy that. But beyond that, we have um, lots of tours, workshops, local artist series speakers, um, Laura Milas and Ann Becker, who are the co-coordinators for the local committee, have uh, helped me along with the, the group to really put together a part of a team effort of, of bringing some really outstanding experiences for people. Another great uh, young artist um, from California is Jesse Rito. Um, he does some amazing paintings, and I think um, it'll be really exciting for people to see his work and hear him speak. Uh, one of the local universities in Chicago is actually bringing him in for a workshop the week before, and then he'll stay for convention and speak to our to our attendees. So it's a nice collaborative effort with that as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we're going to have the big party on uh, uh, Thursday night. Festive Green, Artists and Gallery, so you don't want to miss out. I know um, I'm excited to see Olivia Goody again. She um, keynoted with uh, Catherine Douglas at the Iowa Art Educators Conference this fall, and that was just nice. really excellent. And I was able to sit in on a session with Olivia Goody and was really blown away. And I didn't get to see the slam last. I'm really excited to go check that out. I've heard it's it's really awesome. So it's worth it. It's I will worth say. It. I, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around this artist that you brought in who both worked for uh, Victoria's Secret and yeah. then also with NASA. And I'm, yeah. that could make for some really interesting mashup, like, <laughs> assets of, like, space, lingerie. Like, there you go. I had, I, I, I focused, Bob. I was listening, but like, I was definitely, like, I had, I was running some scenarios in my head. I, I, fascinating. <laughs> that creative brain was working, wasn't it, Andrew? Totally, man. You just yes. give me a little bit and I'm off and running. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. That's what art should do. That's yeah. what art should do. <laughs> well, hey, Bob, you know, um, ever since we kind of uh, publicized a couple weeks ago, maybe three, four weeks ago, that you were going to be our guest on um, episode 17, um, Tim and I have been getting some audience interactions and some questions like, you know, I thought I put together a really good presentation and I didn't get in and why didn't this teacher could get in? And and I know a little bit behind the scenes that the numbers are really high, but can you talk about maybe the percentage of presentations accepted and then how all of the proposals are judged and, and how those decisions get made? You bet, of course, um, because those questions I know come out every single year. Right. Um, really, to have your proposal accepted for the convention is very prestigious, and the competition for quality proposals, um, you know, it grows every single year. Uh, Dr. Deborah Reeve has been on board with uh, NAEA now for about 10 years, and uh, the quality of our convention has grown immensely over the time that she's been uh, tenure uh, with NAEA. Um, in the last five years, NAE, NAEA received more than 2,500 proposals annually. So that, that's a huge number, um, which is up between 1,200 and 1,800 from previous years. So uh, just the proposals themselves are growing. Um, um, all the proposals are peer-reviewed at least two times, and then they're uh, scored according to three different uh, criteria, um, relevance of the topic, clarity of purpose, and the overall quality of the proposal. Um, we typically have between 37 and 41 percent of the proposals that are accepted. And on a scale up to 12, you have to get about an 11 or a 12 on the score in order to be able to be accepted into uh, the convention with your proposal. So um, based on member feedback, NAA encourages uh, multiple presenters for each proposal because that allows a greater opportunity for several members to present and then share their ideas. You know, it's always great to get multiple perspectives from people. So if you can have multiple people presenting, that's a, a, a really good thing. It's a beneficial thing to people that are sitting in the audience. Um, so whether your proposal was accepted or not, you can be assured that it did receive a thorough review 
and that the competition is really stiff. You know, it continues uh, to get that by way that way. Dr. Reeve came in saying, "I want to improve the quality of our convention," and she definitely has done that um, in lots of ways. And one of those is through this uh, proposal process. However. Um, if your proposal is not accepted, we know some of you sitting out there, yours weren't, you can always contact NAEA to find out your overall score and then learn about the areas that lowered your score. Um, this is offered as an opportunity to help members to learn from the experience and maybe to encourage uh, some refinement on the proposal and then we certainly encourage people to continue to submit year after year. You know, I just want to say, so I, I didn't until for the first time. I, I got a couple in and I did get one in this year also and I gotta say what was beneficial for me is when I write those I write with another art teacher mm -hmm. and I kind of proofread hers and check hers out and not proofreading um, per se but just like does that really sound like what I'm getting at and like is it clear I think is the thing that having kind of a collaborator and a co-writer really kind of helps um, hone the voice of, of the proposal so not that, you know, I just think it was helpful, so. Yeah. No, I would agree. And then um, certainly if several of you are putting in a proposal, having that pass between you through a, a Google Drive a document or whatever it is you might be doing is a really beneficial thing to do because, uh, you know, several eyes are better than just one set. Very true. All right. Uh, if we can sort of expand beyond the, the talk about the conference, so, uh, Bob, I know you've been a, a big advocate for teachers doing research and research-based art education. Uh, I think, though, there are a lot of teachers that get a little bit intimidated when it comes to the word research and don't really know how or where to get started. Uh, is there some advice you can offer those teachers when it comes to research and how they can incorporate that in their classroom? Certainly, certainly, I, I, and I can appreciate that because I was one of those teachers uh, before I got comfortable with the R word um, and uh, started thinking of it more as curiosity. And if, if that's a term that you're more comfortable with, that's what I would put in, in replace of the, of the word research if that's the direction you want to go. Uh, but in the end, the concept of research mm -hmm. is an important one uh, right now, most definitely in our educational field, whether it's art education or um, any any uh, area of education. Um, you might recall that NAAA established the Research Commission um, for the purpose of looking at research and they are really doing some amazing work to support NAA members in research interests. Um, there's teacher researchers that are featured in NAEA monthly webinars which are free to all members and they're actually archived in the virtual art educators for all members to access anytime. Um, they, uh, the Commission also hosts a regular cyber cafe um, those are chats about research, and they're often presented by well-known uh, researchers that are currently in the field. Um, this does give the opportunity for all members uh, to uh, uh, ask questions and share their insights about research with those who are leading the research, as well as all, all others that are pursuing research. Um, I'm also part of the uh, professional learning group uh, through, through research. Um, I'm the elementary representative for that group, and it is actually a subgroup of the commission. Um, and one of our goals has always been, from the beginning, even prior to, to my tenure on the group, is to make sure that everyone understands that everyone is a researcher in some way. Um, I think it's a matter of a mindset. It's getting people to realize, I actually do action research in my classroom every single day. If I have a curiosity I'm trying to, to, to solve, if I have something I'm trying to figure out, um, if I'm putting forth ideas and I'm testing things out, um, you're actually doing action research. So if you can start with that little tidbit and think of it that way, um, it may not go any further than that, but you could also formalize it and think of it as an actually uh, more of a, a formalized research kind of experience. Um, people continually have questions and curios curios curiosities uh, they want more information about, and that could be in curriculum, instruction, assessment. You know, ask a question of yourself, Figure out what direction you're going to go to try it out. Give it a try. If it doesn't work, ask why it didn't and try something else. I mean, I, I think we're doing that all the time. We just don't realize that we're researching every single day. Right. That's a really good answer. And, you know, I, I think those are some really good suggestions on kind of how to make things a little more accessible. Uh, you know, and whether you formalize it or not, it can still help your instruction. Um, Most definitely. But, in, you know, if... 
I can say though, I, I still think there's a little bit of a disconnect. You talked about, you know, a lot of those teachers that are featured, uh, you know, on the webinars and in like the NAEA publications, and there seems to be like a, a little bit of a gap for some people between, you know, what they're reading and what they're seeing and what's actually happening in their classroom. Do you get that impression? Like, do you think there's a big gap? And if there is, how how do we bridge that? Make those things more accessible to uh, more of our classroom teachers. Yeah, I, I think I think that has been true, and I think NAEA is doing what they can to really um, point out that there's people that are in the field actually doing the research and sharing that information. Um, the data that we're collecting shows the, that topics and interests addressed are driven by what members say they want. And so NAEA, mm -hmm. NAEA is hitting the mark between teaching practice, rigor, and aspirations. Um, if you just look at the issues of the Journal of Art Education, which is the official bi-monthly journal of the NAEA, um, just over the last right. few, few years, the editors have successfully bridged research and practice. In fact, in the most recent issue, the November issue, um, mm -hmm. which was titled Masked Making, uh, with a focus on identity and art making, there have been there were several um, uh, opportunities for uh, people that are in the field that have contributed to that document. Um, I know we have a question coming up about the art teacher Facebook page, and just recently I noticed a very lengthy discussion that took place between art educators and this on this topic with James Haywood Rowling Jr., who is the editor of Art Education. And you know I think those kinds of conversations that we can have are are impactful and they're important, and we're getting the message to somebody like James who has that direct influence on what it is that, that can happen in bridging that gap between, those, uh, between research and the practitioners. Um, I think it's happening. Is there room for more improvement? Certainly. I think um, NAEA is open to whatever kind of suggestions, ideas that practitioners have, as well as researchers, in order to make sure that it's pertinent to everybody in the art education field. Yeah, very true. Um, and you know, let's jump back on that that Facebook thing real quick. Yeah. I'm not on on there a lot, but you know, I I do enjoy the art teachers group on there. And anytime I see you on there, Bob, you were you know not only insightful with things, but you were just like relentlessly positive with everything. Uh, why is that important to you? Why do you think it's important to take that sort of positive approach on social media? Well, first of all, Tim, thank you for noticing. I you know that that is. Um, <laughs> That is one of my focuses. That's one of my things I try to do on a daily life in uh, everything that I do, but um, especially when it comes to social media because we do run across a lot of um, negativity, um, and, and I think we as professionals really need to try to uh, uh, you know, break that down um, and, and make sure mm -hmm. we're just as positive as we can. Um, yeah. Now, I really do understand that it's important for people to vent frustrations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something we all need as part of the human experience. I, I do it in my personal life. I do it professionally. But I find ways to do it that aren't public necessarily. You know, in other words, mm -hmm. I might find a, a, a colleague that I know it's only going to happen between the two of us. And mm -hmm. I, I, I go ahead and I share that frustration. And then we, we, we take it the next step, which is I think a lot of times what educators, uh, not just art educators, but educators in general, have, uh, don't, don't always follow up. And they, and they start to look at what are solutions to the problem, you know. We love to get, I've noticed people get on there, they love to vent, and they love people commiserating with them. Yes. You know? yeah. they, they, they like that, and, and I, again, I understand that. That's part of the human condition. But how do we take that the next step further? How do we, say, move the needle? And how do we um, make sure that we're having a positive impact on what it is that we're doing? You know, it's really up to us to take charge of our profession. And um, it's important that we take the challenge in deepening the knowledge and understanding of, uh, to others. I mean, teachers that are not art educators, principals, superintendents, school board members, you know, all these people find their ways into social media. And mm -hmm. um, the last thing we want to do is have them come onto a, a page or a, find a screenshot of uh, negativity um, that doesn't send the message that we want as professional art educa uh, professional right. educators. Right. Um, so, my my hope is that we um, are proactive professionals, um, that we step up and introduce and lead conversations about art education, which is what matters to what we do and what we feel is the best for for our students. Yeah. Woo! Well said. That was, that was your uh, mic drop moment. That yeah. Thank did. you. <laughs> there were there were some good little quotable uh, quotables in there. So. Uh, hey, uh, Bob. I want to ask you a question from Crowdcast because this is kind of a good one. Um, okay. 
offered up by Paige Hannenberg, one of our favorite listeners. She's always oh, on right. and asking some good questions. So Very she good. just kind of was wondering about some suggestions for teachers who are really dying to attend, want to attend, but school doesn't support it, don't have the funds for it. Any tips for how those teachers can make it happen and make it financially happen for them? Certainly. Um, I think, first of all, the, the first word that comes to me is being relentless. You have to be relentless. Um, you know, if you don't get to go one year, I think you keep asking. Don't let the one time, sh you know, shot down from your principal or your administrator saying you can't go and you don't get um, administrative support uh, stop you. Um, you know, and a lot of times if you are able to get your presentation in, um, administrators will provide some kind of support, whether it's sub-leave, registration, paying for a hotel or a flight. Um, I think that's a key piece to that. And so uh, working diligently and trying to um, work with one or two other members to get that presentation in can be very beneficial um, in, in doing that. Uh, another piece, and I know Tim said that he's used this before, there's a, there's a letter um, on the NAEA website on the convention mm -hmm. page that actually is a call for support. Um, and so you can pull that letter off, print it, you can hand it to your administrator, and it just speaks to the importance of attending our national convention for learning, for professional growth, um, and it's signed by Dr. Reeve, um, our executive director. So um, those would be a couple of things that I would recommend. Um, I actually spoke to Dr. Reeve today, and she was very excited to share that NAEA is um, actually looking to create a scholarship fund to support uh, professional learning. So this is something that's coming down the path. And so this could be a potential for some members to receive some funding, some support, um, not only for national convention, but potentially for some other professional uh, growth experiences. Um, and that is what I have loved about NAEA ever since I've been a member, and especially over the last 10 years, is they listen to members and then they respond. And uh, this is certainly, certainly, Dr. Reeve has heard, uh, Kathy Deuce, who is the manager for conventions, she's heard it before, um, and it seems like NAE is really trying to uh, find ways to make it happen for, for members. So don't stop. That's fantastic. So Get in there. Yeah, well, and I want to have like a little like old-timey 1950s uh, news feed that's like, did, 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 did. you heard it here, <laughs> <Just> folks. <laughs> <laughs> you were breaking news that there's going to be some scholarship funding. That's really awesome. That's very cool. That's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, brand new. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so now, Bob, you know, you what you just said about the importance of being um, in AEA and how it's evolved, um, you know, and, and I think everything that I've kind of gotten to and done and how I've grown, I can attribute to when I first started going to state uh, conferences back in 2005 and and all that's kind of broadened my horizon. So what do you think is such an important part to be a member of your NAEA and then your state uh, organization? Certainly. I think membership in both is vitally important. And, and to simply state it, um, I'm a professional art, education, art educator. I need to belong to my professional art education association. I think it's as simple as that. Um, I, it doesn't matter what profession you're in. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, a graphic artist, or a school principal. Being a member of your professional association um, speaks volumes to your commitment as a professional. Um, and I really couldn't imagine not being part of this organization. I mean, there's amazing benefits, and I know we're going to get to some of those benefits here um, coming up in another question. Um, but one of the biggest benefits is making those connections to people and networking with people. I mean, I've, I've met amazing people like Tim and Andrew. In fact, mm -hmm. Andrew and I uh, spent some time, uh, was it Oklahoma City, Andrew? Is that where yep. we were? Yep. We were at a regional meeting? Yeah. Yep. And so um, without NAE, I wouldn't meet some of the amazing people that I'm talking to here and many of you that uh, I'm friends with and I'm colleagues with um, that are out there in the um, art of education uh, audience right now that are listening. So, um, uh, you know, a professional community is a place where your ideas are tested, um, where you get to learn from people firsthand who are in the field, who are outstanding art educators. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a vital, important part of what it is for me as a professional. Um, NAEA is an organization that has been created for members, by members. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to have been elected in to, to different uh, parts of this association, both at the state level as well as the national level. Um, so it's such an honor and a privilege, um, but it also provides some opportunities for me to stretch myself um, as an educator, um, as a leader. Uh, I feel I'm a better teacher. I'm a better leader because of the engagement in the NAEA community. 
Um, and anytime I ask colleagues why they belong, I mean, you're going to hear all kinds of variations on that same theme. Um, but at the same time, then, I also worry about those art educators who have not yet discovered the amazing support and the, the tremendous value of belonging to, profession, to our professional community. Um, and I know both of you have contributed to uh, uh, state, regional, national in a variety of ways. Um, would you mind telling us why you feel it's important to be part of NAEA or your state organization? Ooh, are you asking us a question? <laughs> yeah, I'm turning the turning the yeah. tide here. Turning you know, it I'd say it. It. episode for, for 17. This is a first. This is exciting. Right, I like that. I'm ready. <laughs> You know, for me, it, it goes back to something that, that you touched on, Bob. For me, it just it makes me a better teacher. It honestly does because there are so many resources and connections that uh, you were able to access and able to make. And, you know, whether it is networking or finding new ideas for what you do in your classroom or, you know, just picking the brain of, of another teacher that you meet with. But just being able to make those connections and bring other people's ideas into your own classroom uh, really does make me a much better teacher. Yeah, and I, and I would echo that. And I find I do find it frustrating because I know I've encountered um, people that I get to join, and the comments are always, well, it's $90, and I don't know. I'm not going to get the discount on the conference because I'm not going to go to New Orleans or New York, and I don't know that I'll read that magazine very much. And I just want to say, like, yeah, but it makes you a better teacher. Like, <laughs> And the thing is, like, you might think you're good, right, and, and you might be, but like you don't know what you don't know and like until you interact with more people and see more things like oh, I never thought of that or I never thought of this and here's another expert on this that can make me even better and I know in fact like I've become such a better teacher because of being involved with NAEA and, and also the, the state organization so I mean I think for the people who are hung up on the 90 bucks and like is it really worth 90 bucks it's like that's that's some pretty short-sighted um, yeah thought but you know what you're gonna do I don't know well I, well wait that's that's too negative I'm gonna I'm gonna channel my inner box <laughs> right. Um, right. so Got rather it. than kind of commiserate about people who are upset about that what are some strategies Bob that you think you could get someone kind of over the trying and tipping point like what could you do to get them to see the value of it you bet well interestingly and and I think this goes for most any organization most people don't belong because no one's asked them to join that's kind of the beginning part. We know we ask people continually who continually have reasons why they don't. But I think the beginning spot is making sure that we invite a member, a person to come in and, jo and join our member set. So if we can do that as a beginning, I think that, that's a, that can go a long ways to do that. Um, but, you know, the value of belonging to our organization, you know, it supports your efforts and it provides opportunities for professional growth um, through lots of different experiences, whether it's writing or presenting, um, leading, all those are things that are can be very underestimated by our membership. And at the end of the day, NAEA represents the voice of all our edu art educators working on our mission. And our mission is to advance visual arts education to fulfill human potential and enhance global understanding. Now, I'm going to say that again because it's a pretty amazing mission. I mean, and when Deborah Reeve says it, I, I just love to hear her say it because she says it with such passion. So I'm not doing it as good a justice as she can, but... At the same time, this is the mission of NAEA, to advance visual arts education to fulfill human potential and enhance global understanding. It's a huge mission, and uh, it's one that we as art educators can undertake, and we are doing it. Um, it's powerful, and one of the questions we ask ourselves with NAEA and, and those of us that are members is, what if NAEA did not exist? I mean, who would be representing art educators in visual art education um, mm -hmm. through policy decisions um, that impact all of us. Um, we need to be getting into the minds of governors, school board members, superintendents, and principals, anybody who's a policymaker who has control over what it is that we do in our schools. Um, we need to make sure that we have a voice, and NAEA is that voice. Um, who, would be careful, who would be carefully listening to the challenges and the needs facing art educators and bringing strategy and thought to supporting our work through a variety of opportunities. NAEA does that for us. So to those people that say $90, yeah, I know, um, I'm a single parent. I get it. $90 goes a long ways when it's, it's time to go buy that winter coat or those, uh, boot, those boots that we need to get. Um, but it's also $90 that I can't think of a better way to spend as well. Um, it's, it's really um, investing in 
what I deem to be the most important thing um, that we do in education, that is provide learning through art and creative experiences through art. I, I just don't think there's a power, more powerful thing than we, that, that we do in education than what it is that the three of us do, as well as all those other people mm -hmm. that are, are sitting in your audience. Um, so, you know, I would challenge any art teacher who wonders about the value of membership and believes that all they get is a magazine they don't read and a discount to a conference they don't attend to think about their own professional goals um, and then take a closer look at how NAEA might help them pursue their goal of professional excellence. There's so many resources out there. I mean, I have to, I'm the first one to admit, when I go to the website, I cannot even begin to fathom the depth of what that, that resource provides. And every time I go back, I find something new. And there's never a time that I ha haven't had a question that if I don't go there and I can't find it, you know, I go, I dig a little deeper or I contact somebody at NAEA and they help me find the answer. I mean, it's, it's such an invaluable source. Um, so, you know, I, for those um, people that are listening that are uh, members of our organization, I, I want to say thank you because they do contribute to the NAEA community. And I know there's probably some listeners out there that are not members, and I would like to personally invite you to become a member. You just have to go to arteducators.org, uh, sign up at the top. It's, it just says join right at the top. And, uh, and sign up today. Uh, become part of your professional uh, organization. Um, you know, push yourself, challenge yourself uh, uh, to to belong and to be part of a collegial experience um, where you can grow and develop as a leader and an educator. You, you smooth, smooth talking man. Well. You are amazing. <laughs> now, I just want to clarify. A while ago, I think maybe a year ago, NAA was running a competition to see which state could kind of increase their membership the most. Bob Reeker, I do not know if I will let you claim all of these online listeners as Nebraska oh. State uh, <laughs> awards here. I don't know if I can allow that. Well, be sure you put my name down because I think yeah. there's always a Bob blog Reeker every year. Bob Reeker brought you on board. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. All right. Well, Bob, I think that's going to wrap it up wrap it up for us, but uh, we appreciate you being on the show, and before we let you go, uh, all of our guests have to go through what we like to call the lightning round, so some quick questions, some quick answers. Are you ready for this? I am ready. Shoot. Okay. All right. Cool up, Bob. Now, we've got some local Chicago art teachers on the chat roll tonight, and they okay. want to test your um, Chicago creds, so okay. they want to know... Uh, favorite building, action, or restaurant in Chicago, and do you know it firsthand? Okay. Um, well, I would say any restaurant in Chicago that serves authentic Chicago-style pizza, I'm there, and I have experienced a few of those places. Um, of course, you, you can't go to Chicago without visiting Cloudgate. I mean, that's you have to go and see mm -hmm. that and experience that. And then I have to say this for my daughter, who's 10. A couple of summers ago, we went, and we had to go hit the American Girl doll store. <laughs> and I tell you, that was quite the experience. If you've not gotten there, that's, that's a place that you want to go. And we have many other highlights, but uh, those would be right. some of my favorites. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, that's like, like a pilgrimage right there yes, for any is. dad of a young girl. You right. gotta go there. You gotta we go. even had to buy a doll while we were there, and I carried it around oh, the rest yeah. of the day. So yeah, <laughs> things that dads do. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, we're we're approaching the holiday season. What is your favorite holiday, and why? We just celebrated it, Halloween. Nice. I'm a person that loves to dress up. It's all about fantasy. I mean, I'm a kid at heart. I mean, I work with K through five kids every single day. And so, you know, I live it when it comes to Halloween. So I love it. Can't wait every single year. Uh, my daughter and I dress up every single year. And if you're on my Facebook page, you've seen our, uh, our costumes over the years. So it, it's a great time. I love it. Yeah, you guys are killing it, man. Like, my family, we always talk the big talk that we're going to have, like, a big theme. And then it turns into... Cyborg zombie with a snake <laughs> and a machine gun. Like it doesn't make any sense what we go at. But you know what? You make it. You make it happen, and you enjoy yeah, it. We so just kind of what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Bob, all right. Question. Next question. Uh, what do yes. you wish that more teachers would do in their classroom? More art teachers. Yeah. Would do? Yeah. Um, I think we, as art teachers and any educator, we get weighed down by the minutia. And I know we have to have it in our lives. It's part of what we have to do. Um, but don't let it weigh you down. And I think you need to find more times and ways to celebrate with your kids and your colleagues. I mean, um, in this day and age of testing and uh, assessment and uh, things that you have to do for accountability, take that time to laugh with your kids, to celebrate, and just enjoy kids. I mean, uh, 
Uh, I'd laugh on a daily basis when those kindergartners walk in the room. I, they can say and do things that yes. just make me laugh, and, and it's it's fun, and I have a great time doing it. So celebrate and enjoy. Yeah, very true. Cool. Uh, now, if you could travel anywhere in the world this winter, okay, when we're off school on break, mm -hmm. where would you go and why? Well, if I didn't have the money be an issue and time was available to me, um, it definitely would be Europe. I mean, isn't that on the bucket list of every art educator? I mean, I definitely would be going. I mean, I'm talking right now about some of the paintings that, would, uh, that I would see in the Louvre with my kids, and um, there's no doubts that that would be one of my stopping places in Europe. So that's where I'd go. All right, and finally, we've got the Chicago Conference on our mind. I want to know, yeah. who do you think would make a better roommate for you, Ooh. me or Tim? Okay, and, I, and, and you're going to have to give us some rationale for your answer. Okay. Uh, well, I know you both very well because, of course, Andrew, I have been, I've actually been your roommate. So That's you, true. You're, you're pretty we good. Have a, we have a history. We, got a we history. do have a history. Um, but Tim is only 50 miles away from me, and I've been in a lot of sessions with him. I've been in meetings with him. In fact, we just had dinner, what, a month ago during the yeah. fall court meeting, right? Um, yep. So I'm actually going to say that it would be a trio of roommates. <laughs> We would have to have... He took uh, the now, easy way out. Yeah, oh, I know. I, I'm a diplomat. I'm a diplomat. Um, but here's the deal. If it's only a two-bed situation, it's I get my own bed. You boys have to figure out what's going to happen. Oh, with the other man. So, yeah, we both are pretty tall. It might work. We, yeah. It's the whole height thing. You'd have to think about that. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Cool. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for us, Bob. Thank you right. very, very much for being our guest this evening. Of course. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Art of Education, Tim, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about NAEA, the convention, as well as leadership and membership. So thank you very much. Have a good night. See you, Bob. All right. Bye. Thanks. Let me just... Never can get the people off here. He's still on. There we go. Good. He's got. It. All right. You're just making Bob awkwardly sit there. While I just made him sit the there in it for a little extra minute with his, uh, you know, waffling answer of all three of us. But he he handled it well. You know, he handled it well. Yeah. All right. Hey, so uh, what are you thinking tonight? He had a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff to say. So what what were your big takeaways? Well, you know, actually, this is this is a, a really great episode and really fun, but kind of weird. I mean, for the first time, we we had a guest ask us a question. We yeah. also we forgot to introduce Bob. We didn't say like where he teaches and what he teaches. As far as our you know, he's. This guy who loves talking about conferences he is, and and a he is yeah. the magic, you know, convention coordinator. That's all we. Yeah, yeah. But, um, Bob is a uh, elementary teacher in Lincoln, Nebraska. We forgot to do that, but um, no, and then and then the question that like kind of wish I would have asked because as I'm listening to his answers, one of my big takeaways is like, okay, knowing Bob and, and kind of, you know, having met him a, a handful of times and talked to him and and networked with him. He is a beacon of positivity. Like there's no other oh, way to say it. Absolutely. Yeah. And he is the embodiment of leadership. And I kind of wonder, you know, if he was pegged to do the conference and then that was what he came up with as like, this is kind of like, this is my signature um, mm -hmm. issue. This is what I think the arts are great at because it's such a great fit. I mean, Bob Reeker yeah. and what to do. I mean, it's a, it's a home run. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for me, like he is, he is the consummate professional, you know, he, he is always professional in everything that he does. And, you know, and it's great to see because, you know, there are very few people like him out there and it was great to talk to him tonight. And I knew coming into it. So that's kind of the one thing I didn't know that I would kind of really take away is just what a, a slam dunk the leadership aspect is, but I knew mm -hmm. I would come away with a, a re- uh, affirmed knowledge that like joining your state and national organization is really important. But he said something that really has kind of stuck with me. It's that question of what if, like, so what yeah. if this organization wasn't here? And there really, there isn't a better group that can listen at the both micro and macro level and also advocate for our programs and for our students like NAEA can. And, I mean, like you said, I mean, it's just, it makes us better teachers when we join and network and, and discover all this stuff, so. 
Yeah. And, you know, one other thing that I was thinking about too, as you know, we're talking about the benefits. Uh, one thing for me is just anytime I go to a convention, whether it's state, national, whatever, I just feel so refreshed, so rejuvenated. Uh, you know, when you come back from that, it makes you excited about teaching again. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, just the opportunity, like you said, to connect and, and to network and to interact uh, really does a lot, not only for, you know, your teaching, but how you feel about your teaching as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. And like your, your out attitude and outlook on your profession and what you're doing it matters. I, we kind of got into that today at school about like, you know, mm -hmm. um, that kids pick up on that stuff. Um, parents do other, you know, your colleagues. So the attitude that you're bringing to the table really is super, super important. Or kind of goes back, um, you know, always be positive. You know, you can vent, yeah. but don't do it publicly. I love that little takeaway. Um, yeah. Because, you know, like all that stuff really does matter. And, and you know, to be completely honest and it's maybe not quite fair we are in the profession that we really have to spend a majority or a good amount of our time i shouldn't say majority advocating for our own existence you know science mm -hmm. teachers and math teachers yeah. don't have to say but listen here's why we're important and right but as our right. teachers we really do need to do that so being professional and being positive are, are some big big things to do with that so yeah, very true. All right. Uh, I think it's time to wrap up shop here. No, I got to say one more thing. This is, a, okay. this, I'm going to just continue with the weirdness. <laughs> I will say this. So I, when we went down to Oklahoma City um, for an NAEA leadership conference, you know, you come away with it, feeling all rejuvenated and just like, woo, ready to take on the world. During the next two weeks, do not let anyone come near you who has volunteer opportunities because you will say yes to everything. <laughs> and I know this for a tan because after I got back from the Oklahoma City trip, I was just like, everything is possible. And people were like, would you like to spearhead this committee? <laughs> yes, I would. Do you want to be involved with this? Sure. And then, you know, it's like, I really overextended myself. So yeah, get yeah. jazzed, get pumped, but then also temper it a little bit. That's yeah. my that's wisdom. All right. <laughs> nice. So guys, make sure that you check out uh, our Twitter feeds, um, AOJO McCormick and e Start Room for links related to this discussion tonight. And you can also search uh, hashtag AOE Live to continue the discussion about leadership in the convention and we'll be on the chat roll for a few minutes after the show yep and uh once we are done the podcast will be available on the aoe live page and by tomorrow it should be able to download on itunes the podcast app and stitcher for android users listen to it on your drive at home in the evening or even during your plan time and then lastly, uh, if you have not heard, our next episode will unfortunately be our final episode of AOE Live. Uh, we're directing our energies toward a new audio-only podcast that will debut in 2016. Uh, this has been an amazing run. It's been a lot of fun with you, Andrew, uh, and everything involved with AOE Live. And we really do appreciate the audience and everybody who's working behind the scenes to, to help it make this show a success, but it is time to, to kind of end our run. So please join us for our final episode on November 24th, two weeks from tonight, when Laura Lohman of the blog Painted Paper will be our guest. I am Tim Bogatz, and on behalf of Andrew McCormick and everyone at the Art of Ed, thank you for joining us on AOE Live. Goodbye, everybody. See you later.